Yes. I request the attention of all the respected faculties and delegates. Kindly allow me a few minutes of yours and let me introduce myself and the faculty members of this session. A very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all. I'm Ritupurna from Clarnet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience. And Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used in their platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for the doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be a digital partner for this webinar named 26th Lecture Series of E-Education, organized by the Society of Onca Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And the topic for today, which is very sensational, is Anesthetic Concerns and Management in a Patient Presenting for Whipple's Procedure. Now, without wasting any further minute, let's begin today's session, for which I would like to invite Dr. Sohan Solanki, sir, the Honorable Secretary of SOPSI, to coordinate further. So the rise is all yours, sir. Please proceed. Yeah, thank you, Rupanna. And uh, on behalf of SOPSI, I welcome you all this uh, for uh, all <clears throat> for this uh, twenty-six session of uh, our weekly webinar series of SOPSI. And I hope that everybody is enjoying and like uh, and learning. We all are learning from some uh, someone another. So uh, <clears throat> without wasting time, I introduce uh, to our moderator of this uh, session on people surgery. So I introduced Dr. Uh, Indira Guj Gujala from uh, Nijam Institute of, of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. She's professor um, in the Nijam Institute. And uh, she's like, so she's well known and so many publications she's there. She's editor of ISIT Telangana. And so many conferences we always meet. So um, Madam is very learned in, in this area of uh, onconesthesia. So Madam, please uh, take over the, uh, today's session and uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Indra. Yeah. So, thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh -huh. Very happy to be back for the second consecutive week. And I thank uh, uh, the SOPSI committee and Dr. Josna Goswami, madam, Dr. Sohan and Dr. Anjali, madam, for giving me this opportunity. Um, today's topic is anesthetic management of people's uh, surgery. Uh, as you all know, pancreatic malignancies is one of the most difficult cancers to treat. This is because by the time the patient is diagnosed, he already has very locally advanced or metastatic disease. Now, the pancreatic or duodenectomy, which is uh, popularly known as Whipple's, is a procedure done for periamplary can cancer. Uh, the other features about periamplary ca cancer will be covered by Dr. Shibani. So this particular surgery is very highly invasive and uh, complicated. Uh, though in very high volume centers, the mortality has come down significantly, the morbidity is still very high, almost to 25 to 30 percent. And even the long term outcomes are not very good. 20 percent of the patients who are operated have recurrence within six months, 40 within one year, and the five year survival rate is very dismal at 15 to 25 percent. So the focus of this webinar will be how as anesthesiologists, we can make an out difference in the short perioperative outcomes as well as overall survival. So with this objective, I introduce to you Dr. Shibani Padi. Rituparna, can you please put on the slide? Dr. Shibani is a very dear colleague and she's working as additional professor at NIMS. She has uh, been faculty at uh, many state zonal and national conferences. She also has many papers and chapters to her credit. She's also actively improving herself, whether it is, you know, uh, going for the IDRA or doing uh, something uh, uh, in the research uh, field. And uh, we both are colleagues in the department, which uh, caters to almost 2,500 major oncological procedures every year. Over to you, Dr. Shivan. Kindly unmute yourself. You are on mute. Shibani, ma'am. Thank you, madam, for the kind introduction and uh, SOPSI organizing committee for the opportunity. Without further ado, I'd like to start the presentation. So, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Shibani, and today I will be discussing the anesthetic concerns and management in a patient presenting for Whipple's procedure. 
So in the next 40 minutes, I would be taking you through a comprehensive tour on the pre-operative optimization, intraoperative management, post-operative management, current evidence and research, as well as the ERAS guidelines on the Whipple's procedure. Now the pancreas is divided into head, neck, body, and tail anatomically and has both endocrine and exocrine functions. Arterial supply, as we see here, is by the branches of the splenic artery, which is a branch of the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. Now, as we see here, the head and uncinate process is supplied by the superior pancreaticodudinal artery, which is a branch of the common hepatic artery, and the inferior pancreaticodudinal artery, which arises from the superior mesenteric artery. As for the venous drainage, the pancreatic head drains into the superior mesenteric vein, the body and neck into the splenic vein, and then the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein merge to form the portal vein. But why am I going through all this? Now, as we see here, because the head of the pancreas is so closely related to major arteries and veins, in 40% of cases, pancreatic cancer would already have involved one or more of these vessels at the time of diagnosis, uh, producing surgical and anesthetic implications. Pancreaticodeutinectomy, also popularly known as the Whipple's procedure, is the surgical procedure of choice for resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Now, uh, pancreaticodeutinectomy was actually first described by Koch way back in 1912. However, this gentleman here, Alan Oldfather Whipple, was the first surgeon to perform a complete resection of the duodenum and head of the pancreas in his initial two-stage surgery in 1935 and then a subsequent one-stage surgery in 1940. So broadly, there are two types of pancreaticodeutinectomies. The more extensive classical Whipple's and the pylorus preserving pancreaticodeutinectomy. Now, the classic procedure, as we know today, involves resection of the proximal pancreas along with the distal stomach, duodenum, distal bile duct, gallbladder, and lymph nodes as an end block specimen. Reconstruction, as we see here, is traditionally in the order of pancreaticojejunostomy or a pancreaticogastrostomy, followed by a gastrojejunostomy and then a hepaticojejunostomy. Now, pylorus preservation in pancreaticodeutinectomy was proposed with the aim to prevent postgastrectomy dumping syndrome, which was seen with the classical variant, and to better preserve the physiological uh, gastrointestinal function. Pylorus preserving pancreaticodeutinectomy has now gained wide acceptance and is practiced as a standard procedure in many centers, including ours. However, preservation of the pylorus has been suggested to result in an increased incidence of post-operative delayed gastric empty. Now, this is the consensus anatomic resector, resectability criteria for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Now, as we see here, resectable lesions do not distort the superior mesenteric vein portal vein axis with less than 180 degrees of contact and also do not contact the visceral arteries, that is the SMA and the celiac axis. Photomesentric venous construction, if indicated, is feasible in this type of lesion. Borderline resectable lesions involve the visceral vessels, but arterial contact is less than 180 degrees and if SMA portal vein involvement exists, reconstruction is still technically feasible. And then the third variant, locally advanced lesions. They have more than 180 degrees of contact with the vessels. They occlude the superior mesenteric vein, portal vein axis, so that no reconstruction option remains available at all. So we are likely to encounter either resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced pancreatic adenocarcinomas presenting for surgery. Now, this is a flow diagram for assessment of clinical resectability in a patient with biopsy-proven pancreaticodeutinal adenocarcinoma. Now, what is important for us to understand is that this flow chart begins with conditional staging, where age more than eight years, a ECOG score of more than equals to two, which is an indicator of the patient's functional status and comorbidities taken into account, uh, to decide whether the patient is fit for surgery or needs to be shunted into definitive non-surgical treatment criteria. Now, if the patient is deemed fit for surgery, as seen in the flowchart here, then biological staging is done with CA-19-9 levels and PET scan, followed by anatomical staging that I just described in the previous slide to decide whether the patient goes for an upfront surgery or requires a new adjuvant therapy. 
Now, pancreaticoduodenectomy is performed for a variety of indications, the commonest being adenocarcinoma of the pancreatic head, neck, and uncinate process, which forms around 90% of the indications, followed by pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, ampullary tumors, duodenal tumors, cholangiocarcinomas, uh, chronic pancreatitis with pancreatic head mass, and rarely pancreatic or duodenal injury. Now, uh, Open versus laparoscopic pancreaticoduodenectomies. Well, current evidence infers that laparoscopic pancreaticoduodenectomy is at least equivalent to open PD with respect to five year overall survival and results in slightly better perioperative outcomes for patients with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. As for the robot, robotic PD, yes, it has become well accepted and is expanding to more and more centers annually. In fact, this year, our center has also started uh, performing the robotic assisted PD. Well, this recent systematic uh, review covering around 5,090 PDs have sh has shown that robotic PD has equivalent or perhaps superior surgical outcomes to open PD. But then the results remain to be validated in further studies. So uh, what is uh, important is that or relevant is that it is likely that we might see more of uh, these two minimally invasive attempts at the procedure in the next decade. Now, upfront surgery versus chemotherapy. Well, upfront surgical resection or pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer is feasible in only less than 20% of the patients at diagnosis. And new adjuvant therapy consisting of multi-drug regimen chemotherapy for a duration of four to six months is the current standard of care to downstage non-metastatic borderline resectable pancreatic cancers and increase the resectability rate. What is the NAT regimen? Well, a combination of these agents are generally used, the commonest being uh, falfirinox. Pre-anesthetic evaluation. Now, when we see uh, these patients in a PSA clinic, the patients often present with non-specific abdominal pain and or jaundice, unexplained weight loss, steatoria, and sometimes gastric outlet obstruction due to tumor compressing the duodenum or the stomach. Now, generally, periampillary carcinoma presents early due to obstructive features, whereas carcinoma of the head of the pancreas has a later presentation with more vascular involvement. Now, adenocarcinoma being a highly aggressive cancer, more often than not, we find ourselves dealing with the bigger table here. That is not so ideal surgical cohort with a poor functional and nutritional status, tumor invading the major blood vessels, one who would pro probably require a portal vein reconstruction, and so on. Well, investigations, detailed history and physical examination, along with imaging to evaluate the pancreas and biliary dilatation, biochemical tests to check serum uh, bilirubin alkaline phosphatase levels, CA99 levels and CT scan abdomen with pancreatic protocol to locate and confirm the location of the lesion. Uh, involvement of vessels is usually done in all patients. More specific investigations are dependent upon the uh, history and the comorbids in the patient. Now, uh, many of these patients are usually elderly and they have some cardiovascular risk factors. A practical guideline for perioperative cardiovascular evaluation for non-cardiac surgery has been proposed by the 2022 European Society of Cardiology. I will not delve into it further, but it can be used to guide further investigations in the cardiac risk patient presenting for the Whipple's procedure. Now, what are the PSA mandates? Assessment of functional capacity and nutritional status are important and recent weight loss, reduced exercise tolerance are indicators of compromised nutrition and frailty. Evaluation of these components forms a PSC mandate when evaluating the patient in the PSC clinic. Now, we are all aware of risk scoring systems such as PPOSUM, uh, SORT, ACS, and SQIP that uh, have been quite established to be useful predictors of morbidity and mortality in the general surgical setting. So can we apply them effectively in our Whipple surgical patients? Well, current data says that POSUM is not a very valid scoring system in pancreatic surgery. Um, and uh, in fact, the good old cardiopulmonary exercise testing does predict morbidity after Whipple surgery better than POSUM does. And then there is uh, this relatively newer scoring system, 
prepared, that is the pre-operative pancreatic resection score, which has recently been uh, developed to aid pre-operative decision making and has shown promising results. Now then, this is the latest. A recent study in 2023 assessed a total of uh, four risk models, including the POSM, um, for 30 days mortality and found SORT to be the most useful tool for risk stratification in pancreatic urinal surgery. So what's the bottom line? Well, no recommendations for a go-to scoring system for risk assessment of for Whipple surgery can be made at present. But yes, all these scoring systems can be used as adjuncts to predict morbidity. Functional capacity. Now, reduced exercise tolerance is a potent predictor of bad outcomes. We all know that. So it can be quantified from the history in metabolic equivalence, your six-minute walk test. The gold uh, standard test is, of course, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And studies have shown that aerobic threshold of less than 10 ml per kg per minute is associated with increased morbidity after intra-abdominal surgery. Now, this is important. There is a strong and updated evidence to believe that frail patients suffer up to five times the risk of mortality com uh, as compared to robust individuals. An assessment of frailty is therefore vital. And then there are many scoring systems available. Uh, the frailty index, the Edmonton frailty scale, and often used modified frailty index. And all these uh, indices should be used to discuss the post-operative risk. Now, almost all patients with pancreatic disease that you see in the PSA clinic, and especially those with adenocarcinoma presenting for Whipple surgery, are malnourished. Why does it occur? It occurs because of cancer-related alterations like protein catabolism, malabsorption, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, and pancreatic uh, exocrine insufficiency, as well as due to the side effects of the new adjuvant therapy. Now, and malnutrition culminates in impaired immunity, reduced muscular and respiratory function, and a higher incidence of post-operative complications. Now, uh, malnutrition has conclusively been shown to compromise the post-operative course in patients undergoing pancreatic resection. Now, in a series of 132 patients undergoing pancreatic surgery, Ciesega et al. demonstrated that, in fact, the only factor significantly predicting uh, pancreatic fistula was a nutritional risk index score, NRI score, of 100 or less. So malnutrition, uh, assessment of uh, nutritional status is important, and malnutrition is at least partially reversible, though difficult given the time constraints we have. Therefore, nutritional status should be assessed early in all patients presenting in the PSA clinic for a Whipple surgery. Now, as per the ESPN guidelines, nutritional status in the pancreatic surgical patient should be assessed according to anthropometry, biochemical values, symptom assessment, and organic functions. What is important to realize is that solely BMI should not be used to assess the nutritional status because it does not register sarcopenia in the obese patient presenting for Whipple surgery. Now, various screening tools have been developed and validated for identifying patients at risk of malnutrition, including the Subjective Global Assessment, SGA, Malnutrition, Universal Screening Tool, MUST, and the Nutritional Risk Index. Now, the MUST uh, has been validated by several studies in pancreatic cancer and can also be used to guide nutritional therapy. Now, multimodal prehabilitation. Though often made difficult by a limited time frame, prehabilitation forms the most important factor modifying the post-operative outcome of Whipple's and must be rigorously applied to all patients presenting for Whipple's procedure in the PSC clinic. Now, it can actually be considered as a gateway to better functional outcomes. So let's see how best to go about prehabilitation for Whipple's procedure. Now, uh, multimodal prehabilitation can be uh, grossly said to have the following major components, anemia management, nutrition management, optimization of comorbidities, exercise prehabilitation, and initiation of ERAS pathways. I shall take you through each of them. Now, in pancreatic pre preoperative anemia is established to be an independent risk factor for increased complication severity and blood transfusion in patients undergoing PD. Now, this particular study here has found that hemoglobin levels of less than 11.5 in men and 11 in women to be associated with such complications. 
Now, why does anemia occur? Anemia is common in patients undergoing pancreatic surgery and can be related to either nutritional deficiency and or, or anemia of chronic disease. Now, if you see here on the right side of the screen, hepcidin, a peptide, which is synthesized primarily by the hepatocytes, critically regulates systemic iron hemostasis. It is now established that in cancer, there is a higher hepcidin production, which inhibits iron absorption, leading to a state of absolute iron deficiency anemia, AIDA. It also opposes the utilization of iron despite adequate stores, creating a state of anemia, which is referred to as functional iron deficiency anemia, FIDA. So IDA, FIDA, iron deficiency anemia is common in pancreatic cancer. Now, in fact, we have updated research to help us guide the management of anemia, specifically in the Whipple surgical cohort. Now, if anemia is detected on preoperative blood count, hematinic should be performed first, B12, folate, ferritin, and transferrin saturation, TSAT, should be established. Now, this slide looks busy, but it essentially boils down to the fact that if ferritin is found to be less than 100 mics per liter, and TSAT, that is transferrin saturation, is less than 20%, iron supplementation must be considered. Now, what form of iron? Intravenous iron, that is ferric carboxymaltose, the third generation formulation, is usually indicated in view of the urgency of surgery and need to uh, increment the hemoglobin rapidly. Folic acid and B12 can be supplemented if the patients are found to be deficient. And then further referral to hematology and erythropoietin may also be indicated. Now, the role of erythropoietin stimulating agents, well, there are reports of significantly higher risk of thromboembolic events and disease progression, especially so when ESA is used in patients with higher baseline hemoglobin values. So current FDA-approved indication of erythropoietin stimulating agents in cancer surgery is for treatment of anemia only when the aim of treatment is palliation, not cure, and that too when the hemoglobin is less than 10 grams per deciliter. Preoperative blood transfusion can be utilized for the correction of anemia. If the, um, the degree of anemia is severe, the patient is symptomatic or there is bleeding. Now, nutritional interventions. Now, I have already discussed the need to improve the nutritional status in pancreatic uh, pancreaticoduodenectomy surgery. Now, how do we do that? Currently available preoperative nutritional interventions include uh, oral or tube-based high-calorie uh, foods, oral supplements, vitamins, enteral nutrition, and in some cases, parental nutrition. Now, although not recommended in the 2019 ERAS protocol for pancreaticoduodenectomy, a very recent research in 2023 has inferred that addition of immunonutrients are capable of producing an anti-inflammatory response in pancreatic cancer patients uh, through the stimulation of gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And the results await wait to be validated in future studies. Yes, comorbidities must be optimized, ongoing medic medications must be reviewed and adjusted if required. Exercise prehabilitation. Patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer often present with obstructive jaundice and malnutrition with higher rates of preoperative sarcopenia and poor cardiopulmonary and musculoskeletal reserve. So this is the profile of the patient that you'll probably be seeing in the PSA clinic. Now, prehabilitation programs ranging from supervised formal exercises to simple home exercises and strengthening exercises are beneficial. And how long should we advocate? Now, the recommended duration ranges from two to four weeks in length in those patients not undergoing neoadjuvant therapy to two to six months in patients undergoing neoadjuvant therapy. So what is the current evidence in the patient undergoing pancreatic surgery? Well, a recent systematic review conducted in pancreatic surgical patients has concluded that exercise prehabilitation is safe and feasible, whether the patient is going for upfront surgery or new adjuvant therapy, it decreases post-operative complications and length of stay. However, there is a need for standardization of rehabilitation programs in pancreatic surgery with regards to the best go-to regime and duration that will produce the desired or optimal outcome in the post-operative period. Finally, 
uh, initiation of ERAS pathways. Now we understand that enhanced recovery programs are multimodal strategies that aim to attenuate the loss of functional capacity after surgery and improve uh, its restoration. So the ERAS Society has recommended the updated guidelines for enhanced recovery after pancreaticoduodenectomy in the year 2019. I will take you through its elements. Now, patients should be counseled preoperatively, preferably using multimedia. There is a strong recommendation to initiate prehabilitation three to six weeks preoperatively to improve the postoperative outcomes. Now, there is a strong recommendation to avoid preoperative biliary drainage unless the bilirubin level is too high or the patient is in cholangitis. At least four weeks of smoking cessation is recommended whenever feasible to decrease the complications related to lungs and improve wound healing. Then there is a strong recommendation to initiate interventions to improve the nutritional status, particularly in patients reporting severe weight loss. Now the ERAS guidelines presently doesn't recommend preoperative immunonutrition. The fasting period should be limited to six hours for solid, two hours for liquids in patients without specific risk factors like gastric outlet obstruction or diabetes with severe neuropathy. Carbohydrate loading two hours before surgery and the night before surgery is recommended in all patients. Now, the ERAS guidelines say that uh, pharmacological anxiolytics should generally be avoided, especially in the elderly, to avoid postoperative cognitive dysfunction, and that opioid sparing multimodal pre anesthetic medication regime should be initiated. Um, uh, they have given an example of acetaminophen 1 gram and a single dose of gabapentinol. Now, NSAIDs or selective POX2 inhibitors can be initiated in the postoperative period, provided the renal function is good. Now, as for antithrombotic prophylaxis, the ERAS guidelines recommend starting low molecule, molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin 2 to 12 hours preoperatively and to continue it until hospital discharge. Apart from that, mechanical measures must be used and uh, they also kind of advise extended thromboprophylaxis for four weeks if the pancreaticoduodenectomy is for cancer surgery. Now, uh, intraoperative strategies. Well, we understand that Whipple's is a complex surgery with extensive dissection and prolonged operating times. There is a potential for blood loss, fluid electrolyte imbalances, cardiovascular instability, and ongoing respiratory compromise. So let's see how best we can manage such a patient virtually at least today. Monitoring. Monitoring includes, uh, as for any other major abdominal surgery, with special attention paid towards temperature monitoring and dynamic indices of fluid therapy like uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation when cardiac output monitoring is being used, as well as uh, arterial blood gases. Now, the ergonomics of the invasive lines, uh, the arterial line and the central venous line must be uh, kept in mind. And these lines must be protected from getting trapped under the retractors. Rapid infusion systems and fluid warmers must be made available in the OT. Now, effective perioperative analgesia is a mandate in Whipple surgery. Now, it is important for postoperative respiratory function, compliance with physiotherapy, mobilization, and prevention of complications with provision of effective anastomotic perfusion as well. So, what are the options for perioperative analgesia? Well, mid thoracic epidurals placed at T5 to T9 root levels remain the gold standard. Now, local anesthetics with or without opioids can be used in the epidural to maintain the MAP and should be continued for 48 hours uh, post operatively. However, we are aware of the problems or the pitfalls of epidural. And in that case, the other alternatives that we have is most commonly PCA with opioids. It remains the most commonly used modality. Uh, it is used in conjunction with or as an alternative to regional anesthesia. It can also be used as a rescue in the event of failed regional anesthesia and for step down analgesia as well. Then we have this pop-up study which demonstrated that continuous wound infiltration is non-inferior to epidural analgesia in hepatobiliary surgery. Now, paravertical uh, vertebral blocks, uh, placement of bilateral catheters for pancreatic surgery provides excellent long-term analgesia with less complications. And there are studies which suggest that it can be used when contraindications to the neuraxial technique exist. Now, a multimodal opioid sparing 
uh, strategy tailored to each institutional pro, uh, expertise is strongly recommended. Now, one such example is preoperative administration of paracetamol one gram with a single dose of uh, gabapentinoid 75 to 300 milligrams. And postoperatively, NSAIDs or uh, selective COX-2 inhibitors can be initiated if the renal function is good, as mentioned earlier. And other drugs which have been uh, uh, under the trial include ketamine infusion, clonidine, dexmedetomidine, magnesium, as well as lignocaine infusions. Now, choice of anesthetic agent, inhalational or intravenous in PD, well, uh, the effect of these different anesthetic agents on tumor cells has always been a research hotspot. We know that propofol can exert anti-tumor effects through various mechanisms, while volatiles exhibit uh, immunosuppression and tumor genesis. Now, the data in pancreatic surgery is divided. There is one study which says that propofol-based anesthesia is associated with better survival. While another recent one conducted in 463 patients who had undergone pancreatic cancer resection concludes that there was no significant difference in overall survival and disease-free survival between total intravenous anesthesia and volatile anesthesia. Now, what is the current evidence on feasibility of opioid-free anesthesia in pancreatic surgery? Well, in this series of patients, opioid-free anesthesia during pancreatic resection was found to be feasible and independently associated with better outcome. Now, uh, the lower uh, rate of post-operative complications may justify few, uh, further randomized trials to test the hypothesis that opioid-free anesthesia could improve outcomes and shorten the um, length of stay. But what is achievable is opioid sparing anesthesia and then there is this excellent guidelines on multimodal opioid sparing anesthesia which has been put forth by the SOPSI guidelines by the SOPSI and I would urge you all to actually go through these guidelines. Now fluid therapy in pancreatic surgery there is evidence that excess fluid therapy may contribute to the development of pancreatic fistulas apart from bowel edema anastomotic breakdown and could contribute to post-operative ileus as well. So what is the answer? Old directed fluid therapy? Well, it seems like an attractive option. But what is the evidence in Whipple surgery? There's a large body of evidence which have reported improved outcomes following gold directed therapy, including reduced risk of respiratory, GI, renal, and wound related complications. However, most failed to demonstrate significant improvements in mortality. Ongoing trials like Optimize 2 and Proella aim to provide strong evidence of improved outcomes following uh, gold directed fluid therapy. So uh, the bottom line, with the increasing volume of evidence showing that goal-directed fluid therapy reduces complications, its use is advocated for pancreatic surgery at the present times. Now, in our institute, we normally practice uh, titration or pulse pressure volume to maintain a dry state, for example, a PPV of, say, more than 13 before anastomosis, and then titrate the PPV for euvolumia after the anastomosis. Now, this is a flow chart suggesting an algorithm for fluid management for pancreatic uh, which I thought pertinent. Now, uh, they say that pardon. they say that the hemoglobin should be maintained at uh, at least seven in healthy patients and more than equals to nine in the elderly frail patients or those with cardiac comorbidities. Now, base deficits of more than equals to six are associated with tissue hypoperfusion and use of crystalloids or vasopressors should be advocated to maintain MAP more than, uh, more than 65. Now, persistent hyperlactemia, more than two milligrams per deciliter is again an indicator of tissue hypoperfusion and either crystalloids or vasopressors should be advocated to maintain MAP more than 65. Now, a gap between ETCO2 and arterial PACO2 may signify a decrease in cardiac output and inadequate volume status. And if a CVP catheter in, is in place, a uh, um, SCVO2 value, a drop in SCVO2 value, along with a stable PAO2 and hemoglobin may indicate tissue hypoperfusion. Now, uh, in the same vein, 
we had uh, recently conducted a trial in our institute where we find convincing uh, evidence that respiratory exchange ratio can serve as a non-invasive, real-time and sensitive indicator of tissue hypoperfusion and post-operative complications in geriatric gastrointestinal oncosurgery. Uh, I would uh, again urge you all to go through this particular trial. Now talk about the type of fluids. Crystalloids, the balance all solution are the mainstay. And when we talk about colloids, albumin deserves a special mention. Now, there are some controversies regarding albumin in pancreatic duodenectomies. Why does it occur? What is the prognostic significance of preoperative and postoperative hyperalbuminemia? What is the role of preemptive albumin transfusion to prevent complications? And what are the established indications of albumin transfusion in PD surgery? I shall try to answer these questions. Now, why does hyperalbuminemia occur? Well, it occurs because of decreased albumin synthesis, increased decomposition of albumin, nutritional deficiency, as well as because of an increased capillary permeability, which leads to leakage of albumin. Now, the integrity of the endothelial glycocalyx layer, as we see here, suffers damage due to the inflammatory response intrinsic to the cancer surgery itself, as well as the extensive surgery of Whipple's procedure leading to increased vascular permeability. Therefore, exogenous albumin, when infused to improve the plasma colloidal oncotic pressure, may not correct hypoalbuminemia as leakage through the damaged endothelial glycocalyx layer continues. Now, research conducted on the perioperative use of albumin in pancreatic duodenectomy says that preoperative albumin definitely predicts postoperative complications. However, postoperative hypoalbuminemia is a manifestation of complications or morbidity. So, the bottom line: what are the indications of perioperative albumin infusion in PD? Now, it has no role for prevention of postoperative complications of pancreatic fistula. Now, empirically, uh, human albumin is widely used intraoperatively during surgery, Whipple surgery, to replace intraoperative volume loss, to prevent fluid overload, and to uh, prevent bowel or anastomotic edema. However, it has been shown in studies to not decrease the incidence of moderate postoperative complications. Now, it can be used in the management of postoperative complications, the management and postoperative intraperitoneal hemorrhage, especially the early type of hemorrhage and in patients who are going in for re-explorations. Now, the bundle for prevention of infection includes antibiotic prophylaxis with repeated dosing during prolonged surgery based on the half-life of the drug. Uh, absolute sterility with central venous catheter and epidural catheters must be in place. Hypothermia should be avoided, glycemic control should be good, and fluid management should be optimal. All these factors help in prevention of infection. Now, um, the ERAS recommends that single-dose intravenous antibiotics should be administered at least 60 minutes before skin incision, and repeated intraoperative doses, depending on the half-life of the drug and the duration of the surgery, must be administered. A uh, post-operative prophylactic antibiotic are not recommended in the ERAS guidelines, but yes, they could be considered therapeutic if the bile culture is positive. Now, intraoperatively, bile culture should be performed routinely in patients with an endobiliary stent, and alcohol-based preparations are recommended as a first option for skin preparation. Now, uh, there is uh, this recent study which was published in uh, JAMA, which says that the use of piperacillin tazobactam as perioperative prophylaxis reduced postoperative surgical site infection, pancreatic fistula, and multiple downstream sequelae of uh, surgical site infections. Now, these findings support the use of piptaz as the standard care for open PD, and uh, yes, the result remains to be validated in further studies. Now, patient blood management protocol in pancreatic duodenectomy. Well, institutional protocols for PBM generally apply, but uh, there is general agreement for hemoglobin levels to be maintained above 7 and or above 8 in the context of ischemic heart disease with single unit transfusion if required. Now, perioperative transfusion, especially intraoperative transfusion, has been shown to be an independent prognostic factor for survival after, after pancreatic duodenectomy, which is primarily modulated by transfusion-related immunomodulation. Now, independent factors associated with perioperative transfusion during Whipple surgery include the female gender, a surgery time of more than 420 minutes, 
long standing obstructive jaundice, locally advanced pancreatic head tumors involving the portal vein or requiring a portal vein resection or reconstruction, and a preoperative serum hemoglobin level of less than 20. In our experience, we have found that the phases of Whipple surgery associated with major blood loss include uh, the times when a DJ flexure is uh, being mobilized, uncinate process is being mobilized, or pancreatic head is being resected. Now, the mandates of post-operative care include ongoing assessment and management of pain. Epidurals and regional catheters should be used and assessed periodically. In case of failed regional, uh, intravenous PCA with multimodal opioid sparing medication must be advocated. Early mobilization must be encouraged in the first post-operative day, which can be aided by early removal of drains, feeding tubes, and epidurals. Enteral feeding should be commenced as early as 12 hours post-operatively, and chest physiotherapy and deep breathing exercises must be applied rigorously. Post-operative fluid management it should be goal-directed algorithm with non-invasive monitoring. The ERAS guideline says that uh, uh, drain should be removed early at 72 hours uh, when the amylase content in the drain is less than 5,000 units per liter on POD1. And in patients with wound catheters or intravenous analgesia, urinary catheters can be removed on the first post-operative day or if it's an epidural as soon as they are independently ambulant, whichever is earlier. Now, post-operative complications. Well, the reported complication rate after Whipple surgery is 35 to 50% and includes pancreatic fistula, anastomotic leak, delayed gastric empty, surgical site infections, and it's equally endocrine and exocrine insufficiency. I shall take you through each of them quickly. Mortality is because of sepsis or multi-organ dysfunction. The pancreatic fistula is the commonest and most significant complication comprising 15% of all the complications. Now it is diagnosed by a measurable drain output on post-operative day three with elevated serum amylase to more than three times. Now the patient usually presents with fever, tachycardia and pain abdomen. Prevention of pancreatic fistula, well, somatostatin analogs, though widely used, have actually equivocal results. Paseriotide is a long-acting inhibitor with promising results and has uh, been shown in studies to have a significant decrease in pancreatic fistula and leak. Now, as for perioperative octreotide infusions, there is no evidence of benefit at the present time. Management of pancreatic fistula is by avoiding oral intake, jejunal enteral nutrition via a nasojaginal tube, which should be cytal distal to the surgical site, or parenteral nutrition as indicated, so metastatic analogs, endoscopic pancreatic duct stenting to aid drainage. Now, uh, delayed gastric emptying. Now, this is usually uh, seen in patients with a high controlling uh, nutritional status, high BMI, soft pancreas, and small pancreatic duct, as well as a non-pancreatic cancer. So these are the factors which actually contribute to a higher incidence of pancreatic fistula after pancreatic odeodinectomy. Now, delayed uh, gastric emptying or unobstructed gastroparesis, the incidence after Whipple's is 10 to 20%, and it has been shown to result in an increased incidence of the length of stay. Management is mainly supportive, gastric decompression with a nasogastric tube, stopping oral intake, and administration of prokinetics. Now, the incidence of hemorrhage after Whipple surgery is 1 to 8% and it has been implicated in 11% to 38% of mortality. Now, onset of hemorrhage can be either early when it happens within 24 hours or late when it happens after 24 hours. Early bleeding is usually because of technical surgical source and usually requires the, uh, the patient to be shifted into the OR again. Late bleeding is secondary to complications like a fistula, abscess or pseudoaneurysm eroding a vessel. The mortality with a late blood loss is more 10% as opposed to 1% with an early hemorrhage. The post-operative ileus, the preventive measures for post-operative ileus include a mid-thoracic epidural analgesia, avoidance of perioperative fluid overload, and early removal of nasogastric tube. Management, ERAS has shown chewing gum to be effective and safe. Alvimopan at 6 to 12 milligrams BD and mosapride. Well, metoclopramide and ghrelin receptor antagonists are found to be ineffective and are not uh, indicated. The exoprine insufficiency and diabetes after pancreatic odeotinectomy, well, there is, um, these patients are more sensitive to exogenous insulin than type 2 diabetics and ketoacidosis is a rare occurrence when these patients present with diabetes postoperatively. 
Now, finally, I would like to present our experience of Whipple surgery at Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. Now, the most recent literature to define a high volume center for pancreatic resections includes centers with an average annual volume for pa of pancreatic odontectomies of greater than 35 cases per year. Now, our center at NIMS is one of the highest volume surgical oncology units in the country for pancreatic surgeries, performing on an average 49 cases of definitive Whipple's procedure every year. In this table here, I have not included data on the patients going in for palliative uh, surgery for pancreatic cancer. Now, over the years, we have adopted and have been successful at, impl as, at implementing these protocols of the ERAS pathway in our unit, and we have been able to achieve important goals like prehabilitation, continuous effective analgesia, thromboprophylaxis, early Riles tube and drain removal, as well as early ambulation. Now, here I present the data of 36 patients who underwent pancreatic odontectomy between October 2021 and March uh, to March 2022. Now, the commonest indication of Whipple's procedure in our center is ampullary adenocarcinoma. The mean age of our patients was 49 years, they were mostly male, had a mean serum albumin of 3.3 grams per deciliter and a serum albumin of 4 milligrams per deciliter. And 88% of our patients did not have cholangitis. As for the intraoperative details, four out of 36 patients uh, there is some problem here. I'm unable to actually showcase the intraoperative details, but I should just tell you that most of our patients received uh, pylorus preserving pancreatic odontectomy uh, surgery with an average operating time of around 5.6 hours, average blood loss of 375 ml, and average fluid requirement of around 3.2 liters. Now, 80% of our patients did not require an intraoperative blood transfusion. We used warming devices and epidural catheter in 100% of the cases. Now, as for our post-operative data, Four out of the 36 patients required post-operative ventilation due to various reasons like prolonged surgery and hypothermia. The mean length of ICU stay was 2.2 days. The mean day of Riles tube removal was an early 2.39 days post-operatively. Liquid diet could be initiated as early as a mean of two days and soft diet on the po fourth post-operative day. Drain fluid amylase levels was routinely checked in all patients on the third POD as per our unit's protocol, and the mean day of uh, drain removal was fourth post-operative day. Now, as for our complication uh, statistics, Yeah, so there's some problem here in the slide, uh, in the screen share, so I'll just show it here. Now, as for our complication rate, the overall complication rate of Clavendindo more than two was 41%. Post-operative pancreatic fistula presented as the second most common complication, of which two had clinically significant fistula requiring ultrasound guided drainage and the other a re-exploration respectively. The rest of the patients had a grade A or the so-called transient post uh, pancreatic fistula and were managed conservatively. The incidence of delayed gastric emptying was high at 13.9% and warranted prolonged Riles tube placement and jejunostomy feeds. One patient had an intra-abdominal collection and required percutaneous imaging guided drainage. The singular mortality was in the same patient who eventually succumbed to multi-organ uh, dysfunction syndrome. Now, these complication rates are significantly lower than what we recorded in our institute's database 10 years back. We believe that multidisciplinary approach with implementation of ERAS protocol is the drive behind this decrease in morbidity rates in our unit. Now, though it's a decade since the concept of ERAS is introduced, many surgeons who are managing pancreatic odontectomy are still reluctant to accept the pathways. And we, over years, have found that interdepartmental meetings of surgical oncology, anesthesiology, radiology, etc., and regular audits to be of particular value in overcoming this obstacle when present. 
So uh, to summarize, the role of multidisciplinary team is crucial in patient selection for surgery, optimization, and post-operative care, as pancreatic resection surgery is a complex and morbid surgery. Multimodal rehabilitative pathways should be rigorously applied in the pre-operative period to reduce post-pancreatectomy complications, and adapting an enhanced recovery program for pancreatic cancer surgery is feasible. It may accelerate recovery by reducing the stress response and improving immune function. Thank you, everyone, for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Shibani, for that um, excellent and lucid presentation. So we have actually been uh, trying to improve the, uh, implement the ERAS protocol in uh, all uh, the surgical uh, uh, procedures, uh, including colorectal and uh, uh, other surgeries like uh, gynec oncology. Uh, and we find that uh, adherence to ERAS protocol in uh, pancreatic surgeries is uh, very difficult, uh, along with liver surgeries. And uh, but uh, continuous application and uh, it has led, as you see, uh, the ERAS protocol uh, says removal of Ryle's tube on day one and drains on three, but it is really not possible. Because uh, these surgeries are extensive and they have uh, multiple anastomoses uh, and um, there are a lot of other uh, issues uh, in uh, the management of these patients. But still, we have been able to uh, remove or implement a lot of uh, suggestions in the ERAS protocol in our patients. So we have one question, uh, Dr. Shibani. Is it advisable to avoid perioperative epidural morphine? when pursuing opioid-free anesthesia in accordance with ERAS protocol? Well, the ERAS protocol actually doesn't, uh, and the recent ERAS protocols doesn't mention anything about uh, epidural morphine. It just says that local anesthetic can be used with or without opioids. Morphine as such has not been recommended, but we at our institute, we have experience of intrathecal morphine being used intraoperatively when uh, uh, epidural has not been, uh, has been a problem or it has failed. But the ERAS protocol as such, yes, it doesn't mention anything about morphine or fentanyl or recommend any particular opioid. So this particular substrate of patients uh, of pancreatic cancer, I find that avoiding opioids is uh, very difficult. And um, as uh, been presented in the uh, earlier slides, we do find uh, patients uh, who develop hemodynamic instability um, during the pancreatic odorectomy, and many of many times we have to discontinue the epidural infusions, and in those cases we have used uh, uh, morphine uh, epidurally because the epidural is already there, and uh, we have found uh, good uh, analgesic effect uh, with uh, around fifty mics. Uh, the range is around 30 to 100 mics. We give a dose of around 50 mics per kg. And uh, once the hemodynamic instability is actually, the initial 12, 12 to 15 hours are crucial. Once that is uh, tided over or it, we cross over, then we again uh, restart the epidural infusion and we make sure that the epidural infusions are used at least for 48 to 72 hours. So... We do use epidural morphine, and for us in this particular substrate of cases, opiate sparing is rather the goal than having an opiate free anesthesia. Sir, so you yeah, have so, anything to add, sir? Yeah, so uh, like uh, we do around 150 to uh, like uh, 175 cases, cases every year, and uh, and we are following this ERAS protocol since uh, 2014. And we like uh, we have a like very strong like ERAS team uh, which is like uh, from right from the pre-op to post op see everything and we actually able to manage like as per the guidelines um, many a times our patients are having tea the next day next day morning you can patient can have tea also and we remove catheter as soon as possible and we follow some uh, the, our compliance to the ERAS is around uh, seventy to eighty percent times. So the next follow the guidelines. So the next question is about oh. so you've done sir? Yeah. 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 
in the like when we give epidural infusion we can give like like per ml fen fen uh, follow this opioid sparing uh, strategies in this type of patients okay sir so the next question is any scope of 3% uh, sodium chloride in the perioperative period uh, to decrease anastomotic edema any data except hisa trial uh as far as i know sir that uh, we do not have any experience at all about using hypertonic saline so actually one of the major mechanisms uh, which uh, our surgeons insist uh, on reducing uh, the anastomotic edema is uh, by albumin infusion even though we say that it is probably not very useful they insist uh, but uh, the other things that we actually do is uh, try to limit uh, fluids not only intraoperatively uh, use goal directed uh, fluid therapy uh, even the uh, fluid uh, in the la in the first 2 3 days in the critical care unit also is uh, important and we make sure that the patient doesn't become uh, too edematous or gains too much weight because uh, it has been found that uh, it leads to a lot of pancreatic fistula Yes, we have actually found that uh, intraoperative goal directed fluid therapy goes a long way in preventing edema. Uh, initial days, we have found that when we were little careless about the fluid administration, there was visible edema which was being reported by the surgeon towards the end of surgery. So, dynamic indices of uh, flu for fluid responsiveness can easily be used to prevent postoperative edema. Yeah, actually, that uh, intraoperative. Having all these are not good for their anastomosis, and that and those anastomosis can especially leak in the post op period. So all the our surgeons are always worried about the gut edema and all these things. So we we'll so we don't give much fluid, much crystalloids in intra period. The four percent colloid, not twenty percent. And we have also a very low threshold of giving the noadrenal infusion. If 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 a BP is okay, still we give some amount of pressures so that we we do not need to give so much fluid. Especially uh, uh, during the asthma. Uh, Is or before the anastomosis, and edema really uh, is bad if you have a edema and the suture sagging. So, uh, and many a times I do like run resect. I think sir has lost his connectivity. So basically, yeah, we do follow goal-directed fluid therapy and avoid the fluid overload, not only intraoperatively, but even in the perioperative period, postoperative period. And uh, as Sir said, uh, the trigger for vasopressors is uh, pretty low. And uh, we uh, do start vasopressin, uh, sorry, noradrenaline uh, low dose. And uh, at the same time, uh, keep... Uh, fluid uh, therapy, uh, administering fluid therapy uh, based on the dynamic indices. Now, the third question is, do you insert invasive lines for all Whipples? Yes, um, Whipples is a morbid surgery with extensive dis dissection with a lot of fluid shifts involved. So yes, in all our patients, we have an invasive uh, artery, a radial artery mostly, and a IJV or subclavian vein candidated in 100% of the patients. Uh, as for cardiac output monitoring, we're limited only to patients who are at high risk, uh, high cardiovascular risk. Yeah, so uh, can I add? So like in yes. our center, we put 
arterial line in every patient okay arterial line is a must if there is a pulse but we generally generally do not put central line if there is another indication because right so uh, if i do some 100 ripples maybe i will be putting central line only in 10 patients not more than 10 percent put central line and they are all hardly need to put for the on the slippers indication on the other indication this visual process we use is very like very diluted dose very low dose we give that we can give through periphery also so normally we do not put a central line in our cases at least in our hospital so uh another and... question is role of facial plane blocks in case of hypertension to epidural Yes, uh, when there is hypotension and epidural cannot be used intraoperatively, at the end of the surgery, we do use facial plane blocks like uh, tab block as well as infiltration. Uh, erector spiny blocks, no, we have no experience about that. Um, we have not found it to be as effective as an epidural. In our center, epidural still remains the gold standard. So that's about the question, sir. You want to add anything? No, we can we can just discuss anything we want. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many patients uh, come directly for surgery in your unit, sir? That directly means that meaning we without have... uh, the new adjuvant chemotherapy. And all. So, uh, like <clears throat> I don't know exact number, kitna aata hai, but yeah. So... As many a time the patient come up front even without stenting also because the patient like obstructed patient also come without stenting also sometimes if they have a um, like waiting list then they get stented and that they like bilirubin system is drained and then they come for surgery but yeah um, uh, I don't know exact number of okay, how many times they come but uh, they do come. Uh, sir, I have a question. In a busy center like yours, how do you manage the prehabilitation part? Uh, so, so, so I always say one thing is that uh, because we are a busy center and we have a waiting list, right? So when the patient first come to you for a, a PSE, that time and then patient may be posted by after two weeks or three weeks. In that pit, waiting period, it can always be utilized to optimize the patient, right? So starting from the our PSA, the patient first go to the hospital, even the surgeon, because they all are like part of the PS team, they will always uh, write uh, the nutritional assessment and reference and uh, like all these things, physical and uh, like optimization, the pulmonary optimization, anemia clinic we, we start and we have. So all these optimization we do, and then comes to the all the high risk patient they come for a high risk joint clinic uh, like the discussion so every monday we meet for a, around two uh, around two hour the surgeon and anesthetist and any, any concern team we meet and we discuss all the high risk cases of gi because i do mostly gi and inhibitability so we all the gi and high risk cases we discuss and what best we can do for the patient we discuss and we do so i think that in the this uh, pre operation part, we always use that waiting period of the surgery. Unless, if like if you are working in a private hospital or you are do, doing a France, uh, just this freelancing, then patient may come just one day prior or even the morning of morning of the surgery, you know, and then you are seeing that time. But in, in, I think in not in a hospital, we see the patient well in advance and we can manage and optimize the patient accordingly. So how uh, how often you do all these things? Like how well in advance do you see the patient? So again, the time frame varies. Sometimes we do have time, especially when the patient is going for a new adjuvant therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, for upfront surgery, we usually have the patients are admitted at least four days in advance, and mm -hmm. they try to optimize nutrition with mm -hmm. high caloric foods and egg whites. Anemia, if the patient needs IV iron, we make sure that the patient uh, receives it. 
uh, three wall spirometry rigorously we follow we ask the patient to do some walking uh, mm. we do any monitored uh, exercise prehabilitation mm. uh, but yes nutrition anemia uh, the respiratory part of the prehabilitation and the exercise part we do follow in all our patients and smoking cessation yes we ask them to so we have four surgeons sir, who are primarily doing gi surgery mm. so these uh, the average waiting time for our patients is around two weeks to three weeks Hmm. So most of these uh, are started by the surgeons in the OPD itself. Hmm. So they do the anemia correction and they advise the nutritional supplementation. Hmm. And uh, uh, we are called in uh, for the PAC for high risk cases. And then we uh, actually do the optimization of high risk cases like CAD, uh, whether anything can be suggested for the, their medication can be adjusted. But all the other things like exercise, rehabilitation, nutrition, anemia, and all starts off as soon as the patient is seen by the surgeon mm -hmm. and uh, the counseling part and the nutritional su supplementation, all that starts two weeks. And uh, we are consulted uh, from the, we run a PAC clinic and in that any modification or further evaluation and optimization of comorbidities also is done. So the other question is, what dynamic fluid monitors do you use, ma'am, in your center routinely for these cases? We use pulse pressure variation routinely in all the patients. And uh, stroke volume variation, we use only if there is a cardiac output uh, monitor in place. But CVP, we have stopped using CVP as an indicator of uh, fluid status. So apart from these dynamic fluid monitors like uh, PPV and SPV, uh, SPV, we are also looking mostly at the ABG uh, parameters like yes. lactate and yeah, uh, bicarbonate. Do. And uh, the other thing is, as uh, we have shown in another study, including uh, all GI malignancies, the respiratory exchange ratio. And uh, so these parameters, and if we have uh, the central line, uh, we do the central venous oxygen saturation. Okay. These are all... Uh, now, uh, other uh, ways we monitor, but uh, routinely, it, the dynamic indices is uh, pulse pressure variation. And uh, as somebody has suggested, yes, hourly or urine output also. But then there are some phases where the urine output uh, comes down. But it is not really, you know, indicative of the fluid status alone. There are many other factors intraoperatively which might actually reduce the urine output. Yes, but uh, yes, urine output is also important. But uh, all the it is a comprehensive, in, uh, including all the indices that have enlisted. So about the. About a fluid, like, uh, so what type of, uh, of crystalloid do you use mainly? We use balance salt solution, sir, plasma light in all our patients. Mm -hmm. Not a, I actually, RL? we use both, sir. Actually, there is no selectivity. Both we find is okay, yeah. ringer and lactate. But I do find that when I use more than uh, three, uh, three liters of ringer, the lactate does go up. It does influence yes. a little bit. But then otherwise, mm -hmm. actually, there's not much difference between the plasminate and ringer lactate. And because personally, I you even, do... Because even the ringer lactate is also a balance also. Yes, yes. It except is. the yes. normal line. <laughs> yeah, so we don't really yeah, differentiate. We said protocol about the type of fluid which all the consultants follow. So there is inter-individual variability. But, but yeah, yes, because, because, or yeah, We do not use any other like, fluid than RL. Most in, in, in crystalloid, so and we work out if the liver is okay, then I think there is no uh, problem of the yes. rising lactate because it get um, uh, cleared from the liver. So uh, as then, long as we avoid normal saline and dextrose yeah. solutions, we are good. Yes, there's no issue. That's right. Yeah. So I personally use a lot of albumin, sir. So mm -hmm. you give four percent, I think you dilute it with the other uh, uh, yeah. crystalloid and give. What I do is run 20% albumin at 20 ml per hour. And at the same time, I run 2-3 ml of uh, crystalloid as the maintenance. Yeah, so, so as infusion pumps, uh, I use it. Uh, so we use as a colloid, not as a albumin like per se, but we use a colloid. So, <laughs> so actually, I am doing a study. So I'll be publishing the results soon. So mm -hmm. how it I'm looking at how albumin infusion can reduce the intraoperative requirements and further complications. 
Yeah, and but especially like uh, like when they acute bread loss, I think giving albumin they just waste of waste of the albumin. <laughs> like so, when they no blood loss that time, we should give mostly give, but don't know. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, if if they can, yeah, I think there's a, one more question, right? Our in output pulse pressure very. No, small. that was the answer to the monitoring oh, uh, question. Okay, 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 okay. I think then if there is no further question, we can conclude the session, right? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for joining today in a discussion on ripple surgery, intraop management, post-op management, everything. So I thank you, Dr. Indra and uh, Dr. Shibani um, for a wonderful talk and a uh, good discussion on this. So I hand over to Hassan to Ritupanna. Ritupanna, please. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I am very grateful to all the doctors and the delegates who have joined today. And we are really thankful for extending us the opportunity to host the session. And we really look forward to host you again very soon. Till then, everyone, stay safe and healthy and have a nice day. Thank you again. So with all your due permission, I am closing the session for today now. And good night to all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sohan. Thank you, Dr. Parna. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shiban. See you again, sir. See you again, all. Thank yeah. you. Have a nice day.